Uh, good morning, good evening. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to also personally extend my warm welcome from Hong Kong to all of you to join this round table, the future of trade finance opportunities for Hong Kong. Uh, this is really a great occasion for us to get together and talk about a topic, I think, crucial to the post-pandemic economic recovery and also the future development of the world's economy. You know, in the first half of 2020, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, the world experienced really serious disruptions uh, with the global supply chains. And really, uh, this was really felt by producers, by consumers, by intermediaries all around the world. However, I think the hardest hit has been the SME, small and medium enterprises sector. And in that regard, the thing that they actually missed the most was access to trade finance. Now, if you look at the problem of trade finance, the issue of trade finance, this has actually been with us for a long time. Looking back to the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, I think we actually faced a crisis uh, with trade finance at that time. And then the so-called trade finance gap has persisted and really has been really running at about one and a half trillion US dollars throughout. And in fact, to this day, unfortunately, I have to report that during the pandemic, it has actually increased. And the latest estimates probably put it at 1.7 trillion US dollars as this persistent trade finance gap. Now, in 2020, in response to this whole crisis situation, the advisory group on trade finance, what we call the ATF, was formed under the auspices of the International Chamber of Commerce. We wanted to address the systemic problem and especially look at how this would help, you know, really relieve the flight, the plight of the SMEs and actually channel more liquidity and more finance to them. Hence the report reconceiving the global trade finance ecosystem was produced. Now in putting this report together, my, my co-chair and I and Marcus Wallenberg and I uh, are very fortunate to be supported by a wonderful uh, group of uh, advisory board members in the ATF. And I'd like to thank them here for their support. But also we were very fortunate to have the support of McKinsey and Foam Business Intelligence as our knowledge partners. And in the process, we actually had very good access to over 100 experts on trade finance from around the world. And of course, we interview many, many SMEs themselves to tell us uh, a little more color on what really is the challenge for them. So we thank you all for this contribution. Now you will hear about the substance of this report uh, later in this round table, but I really want to make sure I make one point uh, and across, and which in my mind is at the heart of our recommendations. And this point is this, I think today we, were, we have the wherewithal to really uh, technically address this issue. First of all, the problem is not liquidity. I would uh, actually <laughs> ask all, all our bankers in our audience, I think the banks today are awash with liquidity. The question is how do we channel this into trade finance and especially trade finance in, in SMEs? I think we, we now uh, can use a lot of technology, blockchains, uh, et cetera, to enable many good solutions in solving this very important problem. Uh, and I myself have experienced a lot of good systems. The real issue in my mind is really all these are independent efforts in digital islands, if you were, uh, that do very well by themselves, but are not talking to each other and interconnected. So if we think about it on a systemic global basis, the real need is thinking about how to actually connect all these together and really connect these silos and this fragmentation so that we can operate globally as a system. Hence, I think the idea of thinking about an interoperability layer is absolutely essential. 
Now, first of all, this is not about creating an overarching technology platform that includes everything, everybody in the world. It is really in providing a framework and common protocols for systems to connect and integrate. The intended outcome, of course, is that we'll be able to actually hook the systems together on a holistic uh, a whole. And at the end of the day, channel finance and help to the sectors that need it the most, which is the SME sector. This report was actually launched two months ago at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. And we are very fortunate to be able to work closely with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, HKMA, and uh, to work on various aspects. And I'd like to thank you again, uh, all my, my, my friends at HKMA for your support. And I think uh, we really wanted to create this round table to really bring home to Hong Kong regional and global audience, the importance of this issue. And to also give the message that we in Hong Kong are really developing ourselves uh, very rapidly into a center uh, for this type of trade finance capability. So I would also, as uh, Al mentioned earlier, really thank uh, UNESCAP and uh, Hong Kong ETO, the Economic and Trade Office, uh, for really helping uh, really put this whole uh, um, webinar together. And then in my mind, this is something that I hope we can start and then continue in a series of dialogues. So implementing the interoperability layer is a process which in, in my mind will happen over a number of years and we're only at the starting date. The key point is the journey has started. So ladies and gentlemen, I think at this point, it is my great honor and pleasure to invite Eddie Yu, the CEO of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority to give us his thoughts in his keynote speech. Eddie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank Victor for inviting me to speak. Uh, and the HKM is very, very pleased to support today's event. It would have been nice to meet you all in person, but I'm also thankful that this event can go ahead as planned in a virtual format. Today's topic is the future of trade finance. And I believe that we all agree that in order to elevate global trade finance to the next level, the recurring pain points of the existing trade finance system has to be fixed. And the issues, for example, including a very paper-based system that is inefficient, prone to fraud and uh, human error, these have been discussed many times. And so I believe by now, we all have a basic understanding of where the problems are. In fact, the various stakeholders, including the HKMA, uh, we have been attempting to solve these pain points by using new technologies like what uh, Victor mentioned, like blockchain. One example is back in uh, 2018, uh, the HKMA has already facilitated the launch of eTrade Connect, which is a blockchain-based platform that aims to digitize paper-based documents and automate the trade finance process. And this platform was subsequently connected to a similar platform built by the People's Mouth China to facilitate cross-boundary trade, pro, uh, trade finance processes. In fact, similar platforms have already gone up around the world, but the trade finance gap continues to widen. According to the ADB, Asian Development Bank, about 10% of the global trade now suffers from the trade financing gap. And Victor earlier mentioned that in 2020, the value of the gap amounted to 1.7 trillion US dollars. And compared with 2018, just two years ago, it actually marked a 15% increase and not, the, and not reduction uh, in the gap. And the SMEs are suffering in particular. You know, if you look at the rejected trade finance request, SMEs actually accounted for an alarming 40%. And these figures all tell us that global efforts are nowhere near enough. And we should all rethink why the gap is continuing to widen and how we can make our efforts more effective to bridge that gap. And the recent report that uh, Victor uh, earlier mentioned, uh, which is published with the support of uh, Fong, 
business intelligence is suggested a possible reason, which is the various digital trade finance platforms mostly work independently and they do not synergize with each other, resulting in the digital islands. And it is as if we are all putting our heads down and concentrating on doing our own work, developing our own platforms, forgetting that it is equally important for these platforms to communicate and work with each other. And it was suggested in the report that inter interoperation between the platforms could help to further modernize the global trade finance ecosystem and close this gap. And we cannot agree more with that conclusion. In fact, there's one project that the HKMA is building, which is called the Commercial Data Interchange, also known as the CDI. And it is precisely designed with enhancing interoperability in mind. By way of background, CDI aims to enhance the sharing of commercial data through a common platform. Currently, if you think about a bank, every time they want to connect to a data provider, it has to set up a new and separate connection, many bilateral connections. But with the CDI, each bank and each data provider, they will need only a single connection to a common CDI platform, which will be built by us. So, so as to allow the banks to quickly access the business data of corporates. And banks will also be able to conveniently and quickly set up connections with new data providers because CDI uses standardized APIs and data models. And it also adopts existing mainstream industry standards like the LEI, the Legal Entity Identifier. These common standards are quite important if you want to solve the question of interoperability. I mentioned that CDI is designed with improving interoperability in mind because the platform can actually link up scattered digital islands and smoothen the data sharing process. It's got great potential to enhance the trade financing process and also improving the SME's access to financing in general. And let me show you how this can be achieved with the use of a story. Just imagine a Mr. Chu who runs a small business in Hong Kong called Jigei with the help of his wife and parents. Jigei import, imports frozen chicken from Guangdong. I, 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 I think many of you will know a place called Qingyuan, which is very famous for its chicken. And Mr. Ju sells them to supermarkets all around Hong Kong. It's delicious and their service is good. So they've got a big group of loyal following very quickly. They want to expand their business and they went to a bank just a few years ago, wanting to apply for loans. And the bank asked them for financial statements that they have never produced being a very small outfit. So the loan approval ended up taking almost six months and the experience left Mr. Chu extremely frustrated and upset, unfortunately. And he was left really scarred by the process. But last year, Mr. Chu was ready to further expand his small outfit again because the business was good. And it was the time when the CDI was doing a pilot. So Mr. Chu decided to just give the new technology a try. And this time, the banks, instead of asking for financial statements, balance sheets from Mr. Chu who cannot produce one, they now obtain alternative data from various data providers through CDI about Mr. Ju and Ju Gay. For example, from the integrated online shopping platforms, which is on the CDI, the banks can learn a lot about the amount of frozen chicken that Ju Gay is supplying to different supermarkets, the value, the daily amount, and almost on a, on a real-time basis. So with all these real, almost real-time sales data, the banks can now understand Juge's latest operating conditions much better without the need for complex financial statements. And they can actually make their credit decisions very speedily. And needless to say, before the data was used and shared, uh, the bank has to get the uh, prior consent from uh, Juge. You know, data privacy is important. In the end, Mr. Ju secured quite a substantial loan at a very nice interest rate and he was very pleased with the hassle-free experience compared with a few years earlier. That's the change that I talk about. Now, what if I tell you that the above, about the, the story about GK is actually a real one. Indeed, it, it actually happened during the technical exploration stage of the CDI, 
when we were doing the pilot. And CDI has in fact been, in real life, has been helping the SMEs in Hong Kong just to take more control of their own digital footprint, like the sales data in the various online platforms, and use their own data to improve their own access to financial services. So basically, they use their own data to help themselves. And through this pilot, we've got the importers of frozen food, importers of sneakers and other consumables, manufacturers of phone accessories, and they have all enjoyed the benefits of CDI firsthand. And when we get more and more banks and data providers joining the CDI, we expect that an increasing number of SMEs will benefit from this platform. But for CDI to reach its full potential and successfully connect the digital islands that I talk about, active participation from banks, data providers, and also the uh, customers themselves will be crucial. So if I can describe CDI, it's actually a, a team sport and we all have a role to play as members of Team Hong Kong. And the HKMA, of course, is a very active member of Team Hong Kong. Uh, as a regulator, we will try to facilitate a conducive environment. And we are doing that by building the infrastructure, building the common platform, and also offering guidance to banks. And for banks, we urge you to embrace FinTech and join the CDI platform. In fact, the other platforms as well. To data providers, we invite you to contribute meaningful data, such as logistics data and procurement data between buyers and suppliers, so as to enrich the types of data available. And we're also talking to the government to see whether certain government data, like companies registrar or even tax data, can be put onto the SDI, uh, CDI. And for the SME owners, we encourage you to talk to your bank and understand more about how CDI can help you with your borrowing process. And together, we can take Hong Kong's data ecosystem to new heights. And ultimately, that will contribute to bridging the global trade financing gap as well. The benefits of a more digitally integrated trade finance system are plentiful, that much is certain. And the HKMA will strive to help bring about an enhanced system in collaboration with different stakeholders. And of course, we look forward to working with the ICC and also the phone group in this regard so that the needs of the underserved segments can be better catered for. Before I close, I would like to take this opportunity to offer you a glimpse of the HKMA's vision of digitalizing cross-border trade. For those of you who have been following our CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency Developments closely, you will know that we are working on a project called Embridge. It is a basically a blockchain-based central bank digital currency payment corridor between jurisdictions so that cross-border payments can be done more efficiently. We have already developed a trial CBDC platform, which is now on pilot, and it has proven ability to speed up cross-border payments from multiple days to near real time. And we are also exploring the feasibility of connecting the three blockchain-based platforms that we have, the E-Trade Connect, the CDI that I just, I just talked about, and the M-Bridge to strengthen the synergy between the three and further digitalize the whole cross-border trade process. First, E-Trade Connect can provide the infrastructure for digitalizing trade finance as well as support cross-boundary trade between Hong Kong and the mainland and subsequently uh, spread that out to Asia as well. And second, CDI can link up the various digital islands to form a seamless data ecosystem that can help the banks to validate the credit standing of the SMEs asking for trade finance. And finally, Embridge, the payment corridor, can help expedite cross-border payments while reducing costs. And we believe that the combined power of the three infrastructure will pave the way for digitalizing cross-border trade in the trade corridor between Hong Kong, mainland China, and also on the APEC regions. And I hope to share further updates with you in the not so distant future. And I hope that our work can be in good progress. But in the meantime, I welcome your feedback and uh, suggestions. Uh, I think I'll stop with that, Victor. Uh, and again, I thank you uh, for the invitation. Yeah, uh, 
Eddie, thank you very much for that a very inspiring set of remarks. I mean, it's, I'm delighted to, to see how the HKMA is really playing a major role in this whole interoperability uh, uh, um, layer. Now, uh, and really how you're actually putting everything together also to help the Jew gaze of this world. <laughs> the <real> world. <laughs> I think that that's really delightful. Let me, let me, uh, we have a little time. So let me, uh, you know, shoot a few questions at you that maybe all of us in the audience will be thinking about. First is a, probably a more general one, you know, in coming up with any form of new technology and adoption of uh, digitalization, one of the things we, we are concerned most is really the, 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 the adoption rate, right? And I know that it's, uh, it's very hard to really, for somebody or any institutions, even large institutions, to really quickly adopt those. You know, so what is the progress that we're really making in the E-Trade Connect and also the CDI? Uh, you know, what, and also I'd like to ask you, what does it take to really accelerate this? And do you also have in mind maybe some policy, <laughs> stronger policy hand to help this process? Well, Victor, I think you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, it's not as difficult to create new platforms or infrastructure technically, uh, but to get the adoption rate up, to make sure that the business use is there, uh, is the more challenging part. Uh, and we've encountered similar challenges for different infrastructure. Uh, for example, for the E-Trade Connect, it was introduced in 2018. It was actually quite early, a time when people are not yes. as familiar with blockchain applications as now. Uh, and the inertia, the force of inertia is actually bigger than we thought. Uh, it takes quite a, a, a kind of push to get people to change their habits, to change their systems in order to get onto this new platform. So the take up rate, was actually slower than we would have wished. But we see two push factors there. One is the connection that we have with People's Bank of China, which is now on pilot. Uh, once that um, link with the E-Trade Connect platform in the mainland China is in full operation, we believe that there will be requests from the other side, the counterparts, that, hey, can we use electronic means instead of the old means? To, uh, to process our, 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 our trade operation. Second is the uh, coming online of the other uh, uh, platforms that I talk about, including the CDI and also the Enbridge. So with the CDI, when the banks are able to do the credit validation through data, that can actually combine with the E-Trade Connect so that they can offer the trade finance through two blockchain platforms in a kind of straight through way. Uh, of course, Enbridge can help them uh, with the payment. So I thought the linkage with the People's Bank of China and also the coming on stream of these two other uh, these two other platforms will help. But the CDI story is quite different. Uh, we are we are still doing the pilot, but the response from banks, data providers, and the users are actually a lot more enthusiastic because there's something for everyone through this platform. Economic incentive is important. You know, if you want to change behavior, you've got to have something that incentivizes them to invest and change behavior. For the CDI, for example, the banks can reduce their risk through the use of data scoring, uh, and also they can widen their, their client base. The data providers can make better use of their data to generate additional revenue. And the users can, like Jugate, they can use their own data to obtain cheaper and easier loans from banks. So there's something for everyone. And we have, we've actually got more requests from banks and data providers to join in. And we do hope that the adoption and the take up rate of the CDI will be a lot smoother and faster uh, than the other uh, highways that we have built. Yeah, no, I think that's a very, very good answer. I think in all these things, in my experience, there's always a push and a pull. On the one hand, you've got to develop the demand, and the other, you may need to give them some inducement, some push. And I, I hope that the adoption rate is like any normal S curve. It may be slow in the uptake, and then once you reach a critical mass, uh, you know we're off to the races. So yeah. I, I really uh, keep my fingers crossed. Uh, we certainly think that that will bring a new era to all of us traders. 
Uh, let me go on to the to the next uh, question that I'm sure many people would be have at the back of their minds. And that's really talking generally about how Hong Kong may play a role in the region. Of course, here in Hong Kong, our first and foremost focus is cross-border trade in and out of the mainland. That's obviously our biggest trading partner, our linkages to the GBA, et cetera. However, I think it's increasingly important for us to also look south to our linkages to ASEAN and frankly through ASEAN with the development of things like the RCEP uh, to the rest of the Asia Pacific region. So what vision do you have any about the, 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 the role that Hong Kong can play in setting up a Hong Kong model of a digital trade and finance solution for Asia as a whole as an integrated trading region? Well, definitely, and, and Victor, I think you're exactly right. Uh, what we are trying to create here is not really just mainland Hong Kong, it's a start. But if the start, if the pilot runs wild, we do hope that it can be extended uh, first to our neighbors in Asia, especially given that intra-regional, intra-Asian trade is actually on the rise, it's getting more important. So if we can get the trade finance process within Asia, to be digitalized, to get more efficient, to have better access for everybody. I think that will be uh, very useful. In fact, if you look at the Enbridge project that uh, we talk about, uh, our first attempt was actually done together with Thailand back four or five years ago through a project called Lan Rao Infinon. And then we evolved from there to invite also mainland China, uh, UAE and BIS to come in. So we always have in mind then when we develop this multi-jurisdictional platform, uh, we will want to involve both the mainland and also our trading partners in uh, Asia. The same with E-Trade Connect. Uh, the, the, the platform in Hong Kong is one thing, but it's important that you've got a link with the other end of your trade, you know, in terms of your trade partner counterparts. Mainland Hong Kong trade, no, mainland is Hong Kong's trade largest trading partner. We will start from there. But mainland is also the largest trading partner of many in Asia. And the same model can actually apply to others. And we will try to push that as well. So that's, that's on our mind in terms of the development roadmap. Uh, after we got uh, the pilot running smoothly, uh, we hope that we can have, especially for Enbridge, we can have an open invitation to other Asian central banks who will be interested in joining it. And also in designing Enbridge, we have this in mind as well. Uh, it's really about how easy it is for others to join. So technically, uh, Enbridge adopts a very open infrastructure. So whether you're using the blockchain or whether you're having the CBDC platform, or even when you're using your traditional RTGS payment platform, you can still plug into Enbridge and join the network without really having to worry too much about, hey, do we have the same typology and all that? Uh, it's very flexible. So we, we do have this plugging in mechanism in mind when we design this. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that was a great answer. And now, now you, I, I, I was wondering, we had such great support for this uh, round table in Thailand and we're actually doing translation. And now you explained it uh, really, uh, Thailand was our initial partner, one of our initial partners in the Enbridge. And I'd like to take this opportunity to still say a very warm welcome to all our friends in Thailand that are uh, listening in to this, uh, uh, this uh, round table. Yes. So I think that, that, that's really great. And uh, I, I think also, you know, if you step back and look at Hong Kong as a whole, and I just want to support what you were saying, you know, our two major competitiveness is the fact that we really have one of the region and indeed the world's most advanced you know, financial centers. At the same time, we're also one of the you know, most important centers for global supply chains. And when you look at these two real comparative advantages for Hong Kong and you hook them together, what is that joining point, that common point? It's something called trade finance. And the fact that we're focusing on that really plays to our tremendous compare advantage in both these major streams. And I, I see that as Hong Kong's, one of Hong Kong's uh, really greatest assets going forward. So on to my uh, next question, which is a very popular uh, topic, the central bank digital currencies, CBDC. 
<laughs> Many of us are trying, still trying to get a grip on, you know, what is it, how do we use it, etc. You know, I, I think, you know, I, I, I really like you to maybe talk to our layman on the C, CBDC, you know, where we are now and how does that really solve the pain points for businesses like uh, Juge again? You know, how do they take advantage of CBDC? Well, the, the way we look at CBDC, we actually started to look at it uh, some three, four years ago, again, when we yeah. started this project with uh, Bank of Thailand, because we, we, we are a little skeptical about uh, some of the crypto uh, currencies, but the technology behind it is highly attractive, which is uh, distributed ledger technology or blockchain. We believe that blockchain holds great promises in solving some of the longstanding problems that we have, especially those involving multiple ledgers, multiple entities, and cross-border payment is one. So we started uh, a few years ago, uh, this pilot project using uh, central bank digital currency, basically digitized token issued by the central bank, very much like the bank notes uh, that you have in your pocket, but it's just digitized tokens instead. Uh, using central bank digital currencies uh, issued by uh, both us and Bank of Thailand for wholesale use, for cross-border payment use. I won't go into all the technical details, but. The result is that uh, through the pilot and now expanding to also UAE uh, and also mainland China, uh, the pilot results are promising. In terms of, for example, if you've been through some of these uh, payment process, actually it's quite painful. Sometimes uh, it takes like three or four days. You don't even know where the payment is. You know, is it with correspondent bank A or B? Uh, where does it go? When will it arrive? But the uh, CBDC, uh, payment network corridor can actually cut down the uh, payment time from three to four days to just seconds in a very accurate way. And the cost as well, for some of the payments involving especially uh, currencies of emerging markets, sometimes the fees can go all the way to like six to 7% of your remittance amount. But when we use the CBDC platform, which actually includes a kind of ethics, sort of ethics competitive bidding platform, that would reduce the fees and ethics costs to just like three to 4% at the moment. There could be scope to further cut that down. So when you think about people having uh, quite substantial payment needs around the region, that efficiency and that reduction in cost is actually highly conducive for them to continue with the uh, trade finance uh, payment, payment, payment process. So we, we, we are hopeful that, uh, especially if we've got more central banks joining in, if we can really be successful in our pilot, got more central banks joining in, forming a real payment network across mm. Asia or even beyond Asia, we really hold good hope that it can solve the longstanding problem of cross-border payment being lengthy and also expensive. It's actually one of the G20 objectives as well. Uh, we, we're not sure yet, but if you don't, if you don't try, you'll never know. Uh, so yeah. now we're on good track. We hope that it will really succeed uh, eventually. Well, this is really great. Uh, you're really addressing one of the key pain points in trade facilitation, which is speed, accuracy, and also cost. We got to get the cost down and we got to do it quickly. Okay, one final very quick question, maybe just a few words of answer. I, I was very intrigued, you used the word that uh, digital trade finance is a team sport. We're all part of Team Hong Kong. See. What would you ask of us if you had one thing to ask? Well, just embrace, the, embrace technology, try out the new platforms. Don't be worried about changing your habits. You will find that it will be rewarding whether you're a bank, whether you're a data provider, or whether you are a customer, an SME, you will find something rewarding through embracing this process. Very good. Thank you very much, Eddie Yu. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Victor.